art. Um, okay. Hogwarts History of Magic class is the only one taught by a ghost. This is no coincidence, but a deliberate decision on the part of author J.K. Rowling. Professor Binns, who may not even realize he's a ghost, is an ineffective teacher, provoking mostly snores from his students, certainly not their interest in the wizarding world's past. Rowling explains the inspiration for Professor Benz, an actual university professor of hers who, quote, gave every lecture with his eyes closed, rocking backwards and forwards slightly on his toes. While he was a brilliant man who disgorged an immense amount of valuable information ever, at every lecture, his disconnect with his students was total, end quote. I think we've all had a history professor like that one time or another. Despite emphasizing the professor's detachment with the living, Rowling in her novels, particularly in her fan writings produced after the conclusion of the seven book series, displays her conviction that history, both magical and muggle, does matter, that it is of intrinsic interest, and that it offers answers for questions of vital importance in the present day. Unfortunately, we readers, like Hogwarts students, learn little about wizard history from ghost teacher Professor Benz. What we read in the canonical text only reveals small pieces of the wizard history Rowling created as a backstory to the series. Fittingly, she refers to these excluded histories as ghost plots. Quote, my private expressions for all the untold stories that sometimes seemed quite as real to me as the final cut, end quote. Since the publication of the seventh novel, she has made that backstory public by increments through the essays on her fan website, Pottermore, and now through a series of ebook publications, which I did hastily read before. <laughs> Uh, the comments. These writings reveal more than the original books about the magical world. Various creatures, wizard laws, character biographies, magical objects, physical laws of magic, schools of witchcraft and wizardry, arcane matters of wizard plumbing, and contain in each of these a coherent view of the wizarding world's history. Her brief lessons in wizard history demonstrate Rowling's rich understanding of how it intersects with muggle history and her intention to provoke deeper thought in her readers about the historical roots of inequality and discrimination and not only the wizarding world, but the real world we inhabit. The particular style of Rowling's world building suggests that the magical world and the muggle world, which is presumably identical to our own, live in close proximity, never fully separated. Magical spaces squeeze onto ordinary streets or hide in plain sight in a vast countryside. Magical people live indistinguishable among us. Similarly, Rowling merges wizard and muggle history. In fact, before the International Statute of Secrecy passed in 1692, wizard and muggle history were the same, and presumably, at least to some degree, known to one another. Even after the statute, major events in both worlds affected wizards and muggles alike, including revolutions in technology, the development of ideas about racial purity, and world war. Before the statute of secrecy, muggles and magical people intermixed regularly without much difficulty. The leaky cauldron, for example, was, quote, initially visible to muggle eyes. Muggles were not turned away or made to feel unwelcome. Rowling seems to delight in mingling her knowledge of British history with her imagined world. Through the Pottermore essays, we learn that the Ollivanders came with the Roman invasion. The Malfoys arrived with the Norman Conquest, and a Malfoy may have proposed to and then jinxed Queen Elizabeth I. <laughs> Nearly headless Nick was a victim of Henry VII's court. Even before the statute of secrecy, practicing magical arts could be a risky business. Nearly headless Nick lost his head, nearly, because he augmented a lady's appearance, and we learn that the fat friar pulled one too many rabbits out of the communion cup and was apparently executed for it. <laughs> Yet the Malfoys regularly engaged in business with muggles, making most of their money this way, and muggles and magical people routinely intermarried without much concern. Rowling tells us, quote, before the wizarding community was forced into hiding, it was not unusual for a wizard to live in a muggle community and hold down what we would now think of as a muggle job. The discovery of a witch or wizard born into a muggle family was also not unusual. Magbobs, as they were called, were even thought to be particularly gifted magical talent. This relatively benign intermingling ceased, however, with the advent of the International Statute of Secrecy in 1692, which in the Muggle world is the year of the Salem Witchcraft Trials. This is not a Pottermore image. <laughs> Could be. Although Rowling acknowledges the danger posed to witches and wizards by American Puritans, saying, quote, their religious beliefs made them deeply intolerant of any magic, and they accused each other of occult activity on the slenderest of evidence, end quote. 
She blames the witchcraft trials primarily on an international group of wizarding mercenaries who came to the Americas to hunt down criminals and, quote, anyone who might be worth some gold. These scourers became corrupt, quote, indulged a love of authority and cruelty, and even went so far as trafficking their fellow wizards, end quote. Rowling explains, quote, wizarding historians agree that among the so-called Puritan judges were at least two known scourers who were paying off feuds that had developed while in America. A number of the dead were indeed witches, though utterly innocent of the crimes for which they had been arrested. Others were merely no badges who had the misfortune to be caught up in the general hysteria and bloodlust, end quote. Many American witches and wizards fled, we're told, but it was the international response to this tragedy that created the most lasting impact on wizard muggle relations, the passage of the International Statute of Secrecy by the International Confederation of Wizards. Though this statute enforced segregation of the magical community and magical secrecy, Rowling cannot seem to decide whether the, to characterize this as a voluntary measure designed to ensure wizard protection against muggles or as being forced into the closet, as it were. And considering their options for response to the Salem witchcraft trials, some in the wizarding world demanded war against the muggles in retaliation. The cooler heads prevailed and magic went underground instead. Rowling makes an interesting choice in setting the catalyst for the worldwide repression of magic in the 17th century American colonies in an environment that she characterizes as much harsher for magic than other places in the world, partly because of its religious atmosphere. But this same period, by the same period in Europe, the era of religious wars, which was 1650, excuse me, 1550 to 1650, a little earlier, had engendered widespread skepticism about religion as a source of truth about the natural world or even about humanity. European thinkers wondered whether religion could create stability, harmony, or peace in society. The wizard retreat from the rest of the world happened at the same time that in Europe, scientific <coughs> rationality offered an alternative source of truth to religious authority. The European witch craze, and I have just, a, this is just from one of the Europe's pictures from Europe. Cor it, this correlates to the period of religious warfare, so the Salem incident is a rather late occurrence. European witch hunts did a lot to raise questions in people's minds about the reality of witchcraft, which came to be labeled as derogatorily as superstition. It's curious that Rowling uses the Salem trials as her catalyst, also because relatively few witches died in this event, 20 compared to the European witch craze, which an estimated 100,000 people may have perished Accused of communion with the devil. Here I have communion with the devil. If you have an illustration of communion with the devil, you should show it. It may be that in Salem in this period, people still took witchcraft more seriously than they would elsewhere in Europe. By 1735, for example, the British Parliament had passed the Witchcraft Act, making it a crime to accuse anyone of witchcraft. Perhaps Rowling saw the Salem witch hunts as an effective line of demarcation between a magical religious world and a scientific one. Quite appropriately, the timing of the statute reflects the real world diminution of magical thinking in the 17th century as the scientific method came to attribute natural causes to every phenomenon. A scientific reasoning epitomized in Isaac Newton's Principia Mathematica, which is 1687, so pretty close to the sale of pressure. As that began to dominate Western intellectual culture, the magical world retreated into segregation and secrecy. Newton himself engaged in alchemical research. And here's his formula for the philosopher's stone. <laughs> Shut up. Uh, although he engaged in alchemical research, evidence of that would be severely repressed until quite recently because it seemed contradictory for the person who embodied scientific rationality also to be drawn to the hidden properties of substances or the occult. So let's get rid of that. Alexander Pope's famous couplet positioned Newton as the great revealer of truth to the world. Nature and nature's laws lay hid in night. God said, let Newton be, and all was light. Power was to be gained not from the occult or hidden powers of nature, sometimes referred to as natural magic, but from those that could be openly discovered through observation, reason, and public discourse. Europeans, including not too much later, those who inhabited the North American colonies, came to define themselves against the rest of the world as uniquely unsuperstitious and rational. Magical thinking came to be scorned and ridiculed during the era of enlightenment and the Victorian age. 
and so in a way magic did go underground in the modern period. Rowling hints that part of what makes the statute of secrecy so successful is Muggle's willful denial of the existence of magic. She explains that mixed muggle wizard marriages have become more common in, common in recent times, and yet, quote, this has not led to widespread discovery of the hidden magical community, end quote. A phenomenon explained, she tells us, by Professor Mordecai's Egg in his book, The Philosophy of the Mundane, Why the Muggles Prefer Not to Know. Scientific discoveries by revealing the hidden properties of substances and the hidden laws of the universe allowed Europeans European muggles to develop new technologies that were more effective in empowering humanity than any kind of magic. In large part, they neither needed nor acknowledged magic from the later 1600s onward. The, the muggle technologies developed out of the scientific revolution proliferate in the wizarding world as well, despite how mystified various wizards like Arthur Weasley seem to be in the face of muggle inventions. Even with the segregation of the magical and muggle communities after 1692, they remained bound together, inhabiting essentially the same spaces. As a result, we readers can see in the Pottermore essays the impact of industrial technologies on wizards. Note, for example, Rowling's attention to the Dickensian city of Coteworth. A hard to see there. Um, the bleakly industrial hometown of Severus Snape and Lily and Petunia Evans. Harry's Uncle Vernon takes the family to Coteworth to avoid those first letters from Hogwarts because it is, quote, so distinctly unmagical, the letters will not follow them there, end quote. Of course, we know that's not the case. Though witches and wizards will rarely admit it, they borrow innovative ideas from the muggle world. On Pottermore, we can read essays on the invention of the night bus in 1865, inspired by muggle transport, as bus service was a new muggle development but sparking some controversy as a result. Rowling tells us, quote, while some wizards, mainly pure-blood fanatics, announced their intention of boycotting what was dubbed this muggle-esque outrage, in the letters page of the Daily Prophet, the night bus proved hugely popular with most of the community and remains busy to this day, end quote. The railroads demonstrate another magical appropriation of muggle industrial technology. We learn that after the statute of secrecy, transporting students to Hogwarts became a thorny problem until Minister for Magic Adeline Gamble, 1827 to 1835, quote, much intrigued by muggle inventions and seeing the potential of trains, devised a daring and controversial solution, the Hogwarts Express. This involved heavy use of concealment charms and memory modification to hide its existence from muggles. Once again, the use of muggle transport proved controversial and, quote, many pure blood families were outraged, end quote, that their children would be carried to school by a vehicle that was, quote, unsafe, unsanitary, and demeaning, end quote. The use of the Hogwarts Express also required wizards to use a train station, which Evangeline Orpington, Minister for Magic 1849-55, decided should be the Muggle Station at King's Cross, modified to include a platform for wizards and witches only, platform nine and three quarters. The signs of such Muggle inventions in the wizarding world, as well as the signs of controversy among wizards when these worlds intersected, demonstrate the mixed legacy of the statute of secrecy. On the one hand, the two worlds remained separated, and the magical world's confidence that it neither needs nor wants demeaning Muggle technologies helps to limit the number of intersections. This may explain why so many older implements, like quills, abound instead of, say, ballpoint pens or even computers. Magic seems to make such technologies unnecessary until they become both necessary and convenient. Thus, on the other hand, we can see that the magical world does not develop in isolation from the muggle world, but it actually is free to borrow muggle inventions when and where they choose. The use of concealment and modification of muggle memories becomes a continual necessity, however, on, in this context, and prevents witches and wizards from acknowledging the ingenious contributions of muggle science to their own world. One of the most important outcomes of the international statute of secrecy is the animosity and disdain for muggles that wizards acquired when they self-segregated, attitudes consistently mentioned when wizards adopted muggle technologies for their own use. Rowling's essays on the Malfoy family and purebloods make direct connections between the statute of secrecy and antipathy for muggles among wizards and witches. The Malfoy family, for example, commonly intermingled and intermarried with muggles, especially rich and high-born ones, 
and because their business interests because their business interests were so dependent on muggles, they opposed the statute when it was introduced. After it became law, however, the Malfoys performed quote an abrupt volt face and became as vocally supportive of the statute as any of those who had championed it from the beginning, hastening to deny that they had ever been on speaking or marrying terms with muggles, end quote. Their historic disdain for the poor translated, Rowling tells us, quite easily into an adoption of the pure blood doctrine, quote, which seemed for several years in the 20th century to be their likeliest source of untrammeled power, end quote. Although the pure blood doctrine is often connected with Salazar Slytherin's refusal to teach anyone with muggle heritage, Rowling emphasizes on Pottermore that this attitude was considered unusual until the statute came into effect. In this climate of, quote, uncertainty, fear, and resentment, end quote, the pure blood doctrine gained followers and developed into a pervasive ideology that maintained a fiction of wizard purity and thus superiority. Once common, intermarriage with muggles would now be considered shameful, unnatural, seen as leading to, quote, a contamination of magical blood, end quote. The next paragraph in this essay assures us that there was no foundation for any notion of genuine genetic purity among wizards who'd been marrying muggles for centuries. Quote, to call oneself a pure blood was more accurately a, dis a declaration of political or social intent than a statement of biological fact, end quote. Early 18th century wizard scholarship nevertheless sought to codify the signs of wizard purity through genetic science and several tests that might demonstrate pure blood status, all of which we are told proved to be bogus. With pure blood fever reaching a peak in the early 1930s, the anonymously published Pure Blood Directory listed out the truly pure families which came to be known as the Sacred 28. The list evoked protests both from so-called pure blood families who did not espouse this doctrine, like the Weasleys, and especially from those left off the list. Mm. Rowling's history of this idea of wizard purity follows fairly closely to the development of scientific racism in Europe and America in the modern era. The concept of biological race was, in fact, an invention of the scientific revolution. In the 17th century, most Europeans believed the physical, that physical differences among people were superficial, determined by geography or cultural practices like face and body painting. Those who spent a lot of time in hot, sunny climates would develop darker skin. Darker skinned people who moved north into Europe developed white splotches, or simply, if they were very young, never developed the darkness of their southern ancestors. But with the advent of scientific classification, Europeans developed a notion of racial categories that seemed permanent and immutable. Carl Linné, also known as Linnaeus, uh, in 1758 uh, broke down the category of Homo sapiens. This is, there's a lot on this slide. You don't have to read it. I'm going to tell you what it's at. Um, his distinct categories combined violent biological characteristics with assumptions about personality, temperament, and even ability for self-governance, and also quite clearly established a racial hierarchy which justified European domination of other peoples. These attitudes developed in the 18th century, expanded at various times through the 19th century, and contributed to eugenics programs in the early 20th century in both Europe and the United States. This scientifically justified fiction of racial se separation and hierarchy mirrors Rowling's discussion of the way fear and des desire for domination led to the development of the wizarding world's equivalent, the concept of pure blood. Rowling's reference to the pure blood directory in the early 1930s is certainly a reference to the era of German fascist racial identification and the presumption of German racial superiority that facilitated the rise of Adolf Hitler. The wizard pure blood doctrine is not coincidentally most commonly expressed among those who would become Voldemort supporters and Death Eaters who routinely harass and kill not only so-called mixed blood wizards, but also muggles. Rowling tells us that those who first embraced the concept of pure wizarding blood were typically those who had argued for war against muggles in the wake of the Salem trials. The pure blood doctrine became an ideological substitute for direct combat. The decision to go into seclusion instead of making war or making peace <coughs> with muggles had therefore unintended negative consequences. Segregation produced both isolation and fear and brought previously marginalized ideas of wizard superiority into the mainstream. Some wizards and witches continued to interact with muggles, however. Minerva McGonagall's parents were a witch-muggle pair and were told that the Potters routinely intermarried with muggles. We know that the Weasleys never embraced pure blood doctrine despite being included in the Sacred 28 and Mr. Weasley's attempt to transform a muggle automobile with magic, that of course, uh, is, let's see, uh, I lost my place. 
uh, is only one example of his appreciation of Muggle technological ingenuity. Pottermore includes tales of wizards arguing nobly, Rowling suggests, for wizard involvement in the First World War. Oh, and we all know how wizard warfare affects muggles in the Harry Potter series, no matter their denial of the magic in their midst or the power of the spell Obliviate. Rowling appears very much to regret the absence of magic among muggles, seeing the dangers in muggle ignorance of magic, as well as wizards self-imposed isolation and arrogance. Suppression, alienation, denial, racism, each of these resulted from fear of the other created through reactions to historical events. We do not have separate histories, she suggests, even from those we ignore or scorn. Imagining that we do blinds us to our interconnections and mutual obligations. Above all, Rowling wants her readers to note how the history of both wizards and muggles affects their present circumstances. The ghosts of our past remain with us. When, Har when Harry looks into the mirror of Erised, he sees his Potter family extending back through the generations and perhaps thereby comes to understand himself. Although Rowling disavows the pure blood doctrine, she does think that ideologies and approaches to the world run in families whose histories therefore help define their actions in the present. This merging of real and imagined history allows readers to interrogate important currents in the history of Western civilization, not only the rise of science and the diminishing of magic, but also the development of scientific racism, the politics of war and wealth, and the problems of the alien within. By transferring discussions of discrimination, class division, power politics, race theory, and war to the imaginary realm, Rowling allows readers of all ages to deal with difficult historical topics in a safer venue. In addition to keeping the Potterverse alive through a Pottermore essays, Rowling reveals through them her deep appreciation for European history and her intention to use the Harry Potter series to stimulate interest in the Western past. Unlike the unfortunate Professor Benz, she does so in a way that leaves her readers sharper and more awake to the long-term roots of injustice and conflict that persist in the present day.